it later. All right. Okay. What's going on, guys? Well, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> That's going in. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, guys? Welcome to the second episode of In Plain Sight. We're your host. My name is Tim. I'm Andrew. And in this episode, we're sponsored by nobody because nobody listens to our podcast. But that's okay because we brought some booze to share with you. Because why else would you listen to us? You want to do it sober, right? So today I we've wouldn't. got our friend and guest joining us, Matthew Peel, all the way from Singapore. Matt, why don't you say hey to our non-listeners? Hello, cheers from Singapore. Well, so you know, speaking of cheers from Singapore. As you guys know from our very first episode and now our second episode, we always start these things off with a little bit of booze, bring something here to the table, share with you guys what we're drinking, and we'll get into the conversation once we're no longer sober. Matt, why don't you kickstart that for us? What are you drinking, man? Well, tonight I'm drinking some uh, Tiger beer. It's uh, representing our home country in Singapore over here. Uh, it's a bit of a lighter beer, uh, easy to drink, and it's it's one of the few light beers I actually like drinking. No, it tastes like tastes a bit of a tiger, like a tiger. A like a beer. It tastes like yep. a tiger. <laughs> nice. Yep. So, for uh, for those who are eventually going to watch this podcast, um, your your home country, you're you're pretty fair skinned Singaporean, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that's the style in Asia right now to have much more fair skin because uh, us jungle Asian, you know, we, we got to work in the farms and the rice paddies. So we're much darker than uh, than the technology based <laughs> countries. Uh, so the tiger beer, man, uh, what's what's the alcohol content? What's it taste like in relation to, say, an American beer, like a Bud Light, Budweiser or something like that? I feel like it tastes like a like a smoother, it has a smoother taste to it. It's a lager. Um Apparently, it's an Asian lager, according to the can. And um, I can't give you a really good description like probably Andy can, but um, it's about 5% alcohol, uh, 320 ml. But um, generally, I don't like light beers too much. But this is one of the first light beers recently that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, is, it, is it your go-to? So, like, if you want a beer, is that the one you go for? Um, generally, yes, because it's also cheaper in Singapore. That's cool. <laughs> That's, I call, yeah, I call it much more expensive here. So a little trivia that nobody asked for. Um, Andy and I, you know, Andy stayed with Cynthia and I in Atlanta while he was going through law school. And uh, one morning, I think it might have been 7 o'clock, 7 a.m., uh, we decided to go on a journey to see if we can find a bar oh, yeah. open <laughs> at 7 a.m. <laughs> And we yeah. drove around for a very long time. We eventually found one, probably more along 10 o'clock, right? On the mm -hmm. lines of 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the beer that we ended up drinking that day was actually Tiger. Oh, and, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Tiger in a bottle. And, uh, and it was pretty good. You know, um, it, it was pretty good for a couple of guys looking for beer at 10 a.m. <laughs> yes. in the morning. Hey, no, we did some work that morning, and then we got our beer. It just happened to be really early. Why are you lying to our listeners? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. What'd you bring, Andy? All right. So I actually made a special trip for this one. Uh, it is a Nika. I'm going to butcher this. Takisuru. Takisuru. Okay. Looks like a Japanese whiskey. Yeah. I wish I can get the title in there. There we go. Ah, Takisuru. Oh, um, it's... It's not what I expected. So this was in the Scotch Isle. I'm not sure why. Um, it doesn't have a lot of scotchy notes. It's very much a whiskey. Pretty strong. It's got a nice color to it. It's a little light for most whiskeys, but decent color. Um, as you can tell, it's got a, I don't know if you can tell in there, it's got a heavy freaking body. Uh, it's very much a caramel on the tongue. Uh, it's not too rich. It doesn't linger. Um, not too much of a burn on the way down. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a little oaky. Um, not very fruity. This, this is the kind of whiskey that I think you might want to drink just by itself. I wouldn't eat anything with this just because it's going to overpower everything in here. So 
uh, grab this, grab a cigar, light up a fire, and just enjoy the night kind of thing. So you brought a space side scotch to the episode last week. Um, and I know space side was one of your favorites, right? So how does it compare to the space side? So actually space side is one of my least favorites. That's oh. just, ha- that just happened yeah. to be my uh, favorite space side. Great um, way to kick off our show. <laughs> well, it's my favorite space. <laughs> side. Um, in comparison, that's rough just because I love scotch. Uh, this is good, though. I would take this over probably a third of the scotches I've ever had. Um, I would probably keep this in my house. It's a bit pricey for what it is, but I would take this over Jim Beam or Jack Daniels any day of the week, um, with an exception of uh, Gentleman Jack. Uh, yeah, no, th- this is a good non-traditional kind of whiskey. I would so, do this again. Uh, I didn't. I didn't notice. Um... I didn't notice when you brought the, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, let me respond to my wife about dinner because I need to eat after this. No worries. Um, so <laughs> I didn't notice when you put the bottle up to the camera, Andy, uh, whether it had a vintage on it or not. Um, how many How many years is it on there? I'm checking. So it's not so apparent, right? No, no, uh, they, they, don't, they don't try very hard to tell you how many years it's been aged. So, so do you think the cost, and, and I know this is kind of a question that might, we, we probably don't have to answer to, do you think the cost of Japanese whiskey is because of novelty uh, more so than merit? So I had a, I had a fun conversation with um, the guy who was running the store while I was there about Japanese whiskey because they, they, they try to keep it on their shelves, but they can. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize it was that popular. Um, he was telling me they're not, it's not that they're popular. The distilleries in Japan that create whiskey are small they're tiny in comparison to u.s distilleries and and scotland distilleries so when they make whiskey they tend to only like send one or two crates to the u.s because it's all they have and that sells out quickly so my store for example would only get maybe a dozen in a month so they sell out sell out just out of virtue of not having enough in there and that also contributes to why there are higher costs so that they're shipping it in for one and two, they're just not making that many. Um, so I, I, I found that to be interesting. I'm assuming that this same whiskey in Japan is much, much cheaper than it is here and probably worth the price. So if you had to choose between a Japanese and American and uh, S- Scottish, Scottish, Scotland, Scotland, <laughs> Scottish, Scottish, Scottish whiskey. Scottish. They both have Scott. Scotch, Scotch. <laughs> Scotch. Scotch, Scotch. <laughs> if you had to pick between the three, which would you go with? If you, if you oh, had a hundred bucks, I mean, to spend, if you had a hundred bucks to spend. Oh, a hundred bucks to spend. Yeah. I, I mean, America's off the table outright for me because I haven't found a bourbon that I think is amazing yet. Um, it's probably if I only had a hundred bucks, I'd probably stick with the Japanese whiskey. Interesting. To be honest with you, if I had over, if you, you if you up that to 150, I'd probably switch the uh, or quickly switch to um, uh, scotch. Okay. Um, well, you know, since most of the people who are going to be listening to us probably going to be alcoholics, because why else would you listen to it? Uh, <laughs> we'll stick with uh, Evan Williams. All right. So uh, I lied, guys. I I told you guys I would bring something to the table that was more themed. To our I saw that today. PBR now three times. Well, so yeah, <laughs> um, PBR, right? You know, PBR is not no, an Asian beer. You don't, you don't need to explain this. Whoever's watching this and you don't know PBR, one, you're what's wrong with the world, um, and two, try it and then realize it's nothing special, but you're still going to buy it anyway, and you don't know why. Well, so okay, <laughs> I'm going to give you. A beautiful reason to drink PBR. Okay. You know, PBR is Do a that nice... again. We lost you for a second. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said you're gonna give us a beautiful something and then you okay, cut out. So I- I'm gonna give you a beautiful reason why you should drink PBR. And Andy, I think you and I we've been drinking PBR for over a decade now, right? Before it was cool. Right. I-, I-, I don't know yep. if you guys watch movies anymore these days especially with COVID going on and you're sitting at home and have nothing else to do a lot of movies are placing PBR beer into 
their scenes now and PBR is starting to advertise again. And I don't really know why um, it, it's, it's such an easy beer to sell for a lot of dive bars, uh, but it's a great beer because it doesn't taste like absolute piss. It's pretty close. It's relatively low in alcohol content. So it's easy on your stomach. And if you drink a 24 pack, you'll get a nice buzz. Right. And that only costs you like 20 bucks. So it's, it's a good beer to drink. It's a good tasting beer on a drunk day that doesn't cost you a whole lot. <laughs> but that's not the only thing I brought. The reason why I'm actually drinking PBR is because uh, I have this condition called gastritis uh, where the lining in my stomach, the mucus lining in my stomach isn't as friendly to alcohol as it used to be. But just in case it does feel pretty good, I brought my favorite whiskey of all time. It's the cheapest piece of sh This is the PBR of whiskey, right? It's moonshine. It's moonshine from out of Tennessee at Old Smoky. You can go to Gatlinburg. You can spend a whole weekend at Gatlinburg and spend five bucks a day and get drunk at an Old Smoky moonshine distillery. Or at least not a distillery, at least a, a tasting station. Not so, sponsored, um, guys. Not sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> but, but here's the thing, uh -huh. right? This is that, you know, uh, Old Smoky moonshine tastes absolutely amazing after you have about five shots before then it's terrible i i can't really describe the taste it kind of tastes and smells like half sweating feet if that makes any sense uh once it gets to full sweating feet i wouldn't be able to drink it but about at half point i think that's that's about right that's, so, that's tolerable, the feet are tolerable then <laughs> what, what's that i said the feet are tolerable then <laughs> half sweating <laughs> You must yeah. love going to the gym. You just like like smell around like, oh moonshine. No, no, oh. no, that's that's full sweating feet, right? So oh, sorry, that one worked. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, what's it taste like? Tastes like shit. Um, <laughs> all right, so check it out, guys. Uh, we're at three forty-two. Today's episode is going to be about Asian food in the United States now. I'm saying Asian food in the United States. I'm not going to include every single Asian food because I don't have experience with it. And I know you guys have your own experiences that are much different from mine. And there are experiences that overlap as well. But for example, one of the things that I can't cover, and I'm not so sure that any one of us can cover is Filipino food, right? Whereas Matt would be more accustomed to Singaporean and Cambodian food. Uh, I would be more accustomed to Vietnamese food. I spent a lot of time in the restaurant business and Japanese food, as well as Chinese food. And Andy, your uh, experience in Korean food. And, you know, we, we did a lot of Hakuna Matata in Japanese restaurants uh, in Savannah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, kicked it, out a few. It, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, the, the reason why I thought this would be a great episode uh, for In Plain Sight is because a lot of us who grew up in America, especially small city America, we know Asian food as your fast food Chinese takeaway that's cooked in the corner of a large shopping center and you take it away. You have General So chicken, sesame chicken, chicken fried rice, chicken wings, and all these other things that people know Chinese food or Asian food to be, right? And over the last couple of decades, that has changed a lot, but there are still a lot of people in the United States who haven't experienced Asian food for what it really is. Now, I don't know if you guys, I don't know the story behind Tex-Mex food, but I'll, I think we should do an episode about that eventually one day. But Tex-Mex food is kind of that mixture between American and authentic Mexican food that they made that was more uh, accustomed to American palates, right? And for many years, and I don't know if you guys uh, thought about it this way, but for many years, I thought this fast food Chinese uh, were adjusted to American palates uh, that Americans typically didn't like heavy oyster sauce or fish sauce or all these other type of fermented sauce that we find in Asia. But that wasn't actually true. Uh, you know, the, the way Chinese food started in the United States or at least became big was, well, the, the way it became the way it is today is you, you remember the gold rush in California, right? Uh, there were a lot of Chinese, specifically Cantonese guys who came from China to California to search for gold. And there was a period of time in the United States that we called the Chinese Exclusion Act, 
which occurred in the late 1800s and expanded to, I think, about 1945, 1946 or something like that, which pretty much banned any additional Chinese people and any Chinese influence from coming into the United States. Well, so here's the problem. Chinese women didn't come over to the United States to mine gold. Chinese men did. And when they came over to the United States to mine gold and the Chinese Exclusion Act happened where they didn't have enough women over here and we couldn't import Chinese ingredients over to the United States, well, now you're stuck with a couple of problems. You got Chinese guys who eat Chinese food, can't get access to the ingredients, and worst of all, they can't cook worth a shit, right? So what happens here is, is that now these guys are stuck in the United States with American ingredients and spices or whatever it is that America is bringing in at the time, which is nothing Chinese, and they're hungry. They're not adapting to the American palate, whatever that is. Uh, so they start getting whatever ingredients they can in the United States and start to cook food that closely resembled to what they could find at home, which didn't resemble anything like what they found at home, right? Because what they cooked back then actually followed into what we find in fast food Chinese today is that same thing that they made back then is what it is today. And that's why you guys uh, and us, all of us experience that type of food. And it's kind of become the norm. Now, you know, even after, after the Chinese Exclusion Act, they still had a lot of uh, laws that didn't allow items from China to come into the United States. And eventually that lifted and we start to see other types of Chinese come in other than Cantonese people. We start seeing people from Hunan and uh, uh, Sichuan and other areas. And they came over to the United States. And even though they had their own foods and they started bringing their foods to the United States, they realized that what the Cantonese were doing at the time for themselves, but started open restaurants and became popular with Americans in the United States worked. So they kind of followed in the same step, right? So it didn't matter what region of China these people came from, when they came to the United States and they became proprietors and they wanted to be successful at opening a restaurant, they all had the same thing. General So chicken, Mugu Gai Pan, <laughs> sesame chicken, and all these other things that we Orange see chicken. in these restaurant menus. But yeah, so, you know, so that's what we got is, is that it wasn't necessarily a menu that the Chinese Americanized for the American palate. They did it out of necessity because they didn't have access to their ingredients back in the early 1900s. And, uh, you know, I don't know how true this is, but back in the 1970s, um, the story was that Nixon was on TV. He was in China uh, making a visit to China and he was eating Peking duck and all these other fancy types of Chinese food and it peaked American interest. And that's when the Chinese restaurants start really seeing success in the United States. Right. And uh, we, we grew up in the low country in Savannah, Georgia, or at least around close to Savannah, Georgia. And we very rarely experience uh, what we would consider authentic food from not just the Chinese, but from Koreans, Vietnamese, Japanese, and Thai, what was it, Taiwanese? Thailandese. Taiwanese. Right? Thailandese. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Savannah, Georgia. You know, we know that we had metropolitan areas and we had Chinatowns that were uh, here and there in the United States where you could go and experience this type of authentic food. But we know that in the last couple of decades, we're starting to see this in smaller towns like Savannah, Macon, and, you know, other areas that where we didn't once have access to it, we now have access to it. I think, um, I think I was driving in Macon one day and Andy, you, you, you went to professional school in Macon uh, mm -hmm. and I saw a Korean taco joint in Macon, which was pretty cool oh, yeah. because, mm -hmm. you know, 15, 20 years ago, that, that would have been unheard of. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that so, started in Atlanta, actually the Korean taco or no, 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 no. That was Austin. It was Austin, Texas. And then Atlanta picked it up too. Oh, well, the, the thing was, was that, you know, we didn't really have access to a lot of these kind of things. Now, we all right. live in metropolitan areas now. And with the exception of Matt, Andy and I, at least, <laughs> we, we have access to more authentic types of food, right? Uh, whereas Matt actually lives in Singapore. So it's kind of unfair. Yes. <laughs> um, so in, in any event, I, I guess where we roll into here is to talk about uh, the different 
types of opportunities, eating and dining opportunities that people can experience uh, in different price ranges where they may have not experienced before because they either didn't know about it or they didn't know that these opportunities, well, or, or that they, they were too afraid to get into these types of restaurants because of some type of cultural intimidation, right? I kind of think we need to back up just a little bit because I, I think a term you used, um, uh, fast food uh, Asian, was important. And I think we all have an idea of what that means. But I think the typical listener here may think, well, what's fast food Asian? I never went through a drive through Asian, uh, Asian place before. Whereas we all think like, you know, there's a counter, there's a big menu above you with a ton of options. They're all numbered and they might have a little letter next to it. That's what we're talking about. Or we're talking about that kind of fast food. You walk in there and it's pretty much the same menu, even though it's the seventh different Asian restaurant you went to. Um, that that that's it. And they probably have chicken wings somewhere on there too. Let's uh let's let's set the record and, <laughs> and be clear about this. Okay, is that we do have drive through fast food Chinese. It's called Panda Express. Panda oh god, no, Express, that's yes. not no. Panda. Let's stop. <laughs> uh, and then we also have fast food. But not necessarily drive through Japanese. Uh, we have them down. Uh, they're down here in the southeast called Sakio and Sakio and Sarku, right? Okay. Uh, which are the, the little mall grills where they cook chicken teriyaki and shrimp teriyaki and beef yakiniku, which mm-hmm. is not representative of all of Japanese food, right? So why don't we take this in order? So what we'll do is we'll go from Chinese food to Japanese food, which I think are number one and number two are most popular in the United States. We'll go to Korean food, Vietnamese food, and then we'll talk about Singaporean food because that's not something that we've seen in the United States yet, or at least not that's readily available, right? Um, the other two Asian foods that are very prolific here in the United States are um, Thai food and Indian food, uh, which I guess we can touch on those, but that's th- those aren't really things that I'm, well, I eat a lot of Indian food and they're all just spicy. Well, uh, w- when we get to it, we'll talk about it. There's actually uh, separating cultures within uh, Indian food, and we only actually get one kind here. Um, and it's very rare to get the other, but we'll get to that when we get to uh, Indian food. Well, well sure. Uh, I think uh, I think one, and by talking about that, we say Indian food, but then you have things like Punjabi food, right? From Punjabi. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then... And then you have everything else that I don't know about, but <laughs> it's a good point because Chinese food is the same thing. Um, very short history about China and uh, we'll get into the food. For many centuries, China was a warring state, quote unquote state. Uh, for our listeners who don't know this, there are Chinese people who speak hundreds and thousands of different dialect because at once upon a time, they didn't consider themselves all one people, right? And eventually, through different wars and different political actions, they became one state, or they're still trying to become one state right now. Yet the food is still very diverse, and we still give their food different names based on the people and the regions that it came from. Uh, most no- notably is, is that Cantonese food is this Chinese fast food that we've been talking about where uh, you can walk into every single shopping center and you can find a Chinese restaurant that you come in, you order at the counter and you take out. And that is typically Cantonese food, even though they sell chicken wings. So do Koreans. So. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, but we have r- our own kind of chicken. We like we, 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 we've done a yeah. good job with that. There is Korean chicken now and it's very different. It's, very nice. The the other two foods that are really popular from a Chinese perspective in the United States, or I'm not going to say really popular because most people won't know this, is Sichuan food uh, and Hunan. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if Lanju food is a branch of its own, but Lanju are the Chinese people who make their own noodles um, oh. instead of buying noodles. And we'll get into that. So let's let's get into it. So you guys have experienced Sichuan food, right? I know I've taken you guys to the Chinese. Uh, I mean, I went to McDonald's in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not talking about that. <laughs> <Sichuan sauce. laughs> uh, but uh, you know, Sichuan Chinese food is known for 
its spiciness, right? Its heat. Uh, and Sichuan food is fantastic when you enjoy the same similar feels that you get and feel that you get from Cantonese food of oyster sauce, soy sauce, and the different seasonings of Chinese uh, food that you know, but at the same time, you want some heat. So not every single Sichuan restaurant is going to serve up authentic Sichuan food, right? Because there's still going to, there's still many of them out there that call themselves Sichuan restaurants, but you won't find things like Sichuan uh, pepper chicken, which is basically cooked in dried red peppers and peppercorn, Sichuan peppercorn peppers. With a little bit of chicken. With a little bit of chicken. You got to search through it. But Sichuan's food is a good choice for you to go to if you like spicy food. But the thing is, is that, okay, Andy, Matt, uh, Matt, you're no longer in the United States, but Andy, uh, you're in DC Metro. How do you go about finding a Sichuan restaurant or Hunan restaurant that is authentic? What are some cues that you look for that say, okay, well, this is the real deal? So uh, Sichuan, I I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, I don't know. Like, I've never had authentic, and I don't know where to go for it. What about Sorry. you? Um, I think my family are usually refers to Sichuan, Sichuan as Sichuan. Sichuan. But uh, yes, um, usually the Sichuan restaurant that we used to like to go to in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, we were just looking for random Chinese food places, looking for Mapu Tofu, actually. And we walked in, and then as soon as we walked in, the restaurant was a bit dingy but still nice. It wasn't that terrible. And it was all Asian people. And there are, none of them were speaking English. <laughs> so, so is that the number one cue? Because I think Andy knew this. He just didn't say it because it applies to every single restaurant, regardless of where it comes from. This is that you find the people, right? Right. If you find Chinese people in a Chinese restaurant, if you can find Korean people in a Korean restaurant, Hispanic people in... Brazilian, Mexican restaurants, or whatever it is, it should be your first indicator that that restaurant is good and is going to serve some authentic food. It also depends on what kind of, like, the style of food you're looking for. And by that, I mean, are you looking for, like, an authentic, greasy sesame chicken, something that just, like, strikes that nerve and go for it? Because you're not looking for an uppity restaurant at that point. You're, you're looking for a dive. But if you're looking for Peking duck, which if anybody knows where to get Peking duck on the East Coast of the United States, that's actually really good. Let me know. Um, like you're looking for more of an upscale restaurant. Like you, you might not see nothing but Asian people inside there. Um, it's it's more of a delicacy. So you, you'd look for more of an upscale restaurant. So it, in terms of the people you see in there, it, it really comes down to what you would expect to see in there for that kind of culture. Okay, so it sounds like either Riley or Alex are awake. Is it Riley? Sorry. Right? No, oh, no, it's Alex. Okay. I apologize. So, so, uh, no, don't just, worry, mine will come soon. <laughs> just to your point, really quick, Matt. Uh, you said your family refers it to as Sheswan, right? Sheswan? Sheswan. 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 Uh, your family, which one? Your mother? My Singapore, my Singapore, my Singapore side of my family. Yes. Yeah, so, so here in the United States, in the West Coast, it's, spelled as if it was Sichuan and then if you're in the east coast it's spelled as if it was Sichuan I don't really know the history behind that but they're spelled differently depending on where you go here in Atlanta from my personal experience you can find restaurants in serving the same food spelled in two different ways uh there's Pronounced the same way, but I don't speak Chinese. So here's the thing. <laughs> I'm gonna disagree with you, brother. Okay. For me to find a good, authentic Chinese restaurant, I number one, I gotta agree with Matt. I look for the people. And number two, I look for the least fancy restaurant that I can find. Well, oh, I mean, it depends on what you're wanting. Well, Peking right? Duck, right? So 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 Peking yeah, Duck yeah, go for it. was once upon a time duck that was served to Chinese royalty and to the affluent. But when convectional ovens became easily obtainable, Peking duck became available to 
you're, you're like the person that goes to a restaurant and is like, oh, yeah, we make our barbecue in the oven. You're like, oh, that's just the same as making it in a smoker. You know, as long as you're using wood pellets, I bet it's delicious. No, you want it done right. You want it done traditional. You go to a place that has a smoker in the back. Whoa. So it, it, same thing with Peking duck. It is a barbecue. It is smoked. It, it takes a long time and it's done very right. Okay, you know what? Uh, <laughs> I don't care where barbecue is cooked. If it tastes the same to me, it's still fucking. Oh, it's still the fucking barbecue. It hurts. Uh, but, but no. So, so okay, that's Annie's thing. But my thing is, is that I gotta, I gotta look for people who don't speak English. The cooks can't speak English, and the restaurant. I think that the maximum health food score has to be around seventy-five or eighty, right? And, oh, and yeah. if they failed once or twice, it's probably good food. Yeah, it's, it's probably good food. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's not to discount what Annie says because where where I live, uh, said it, it, where I live is that the best Sichuan restaurant that I can get to is a relatively mid upper mid tier restaurant. Okay, it's a fancier restaurant where you know where the three of us had dined before for Sichuan food. Where a, a we could spend twenty bucks, twenty five bucks, and feed the three of us, plus my wife and two kids. Oh. But this restaurant, it would be twenty five dollars a plate. They serve the same food, but the cost is different because their show that they put on is different, right? They're serving to a different demographic. So we know that the typical American, regardless of what ethnicity you you're from, is is that you tend to like restaurants or businesses that take care of their rodent problems and you know their their food <laughs> food safety handling or at least they don't make it public because let's yeah. face it every restaurant has a rodent problem okay so so okay how do how do we find one of these restaurants okay so matt you can't look at the type of people who eat there based on google right sometimes Sometimes they have the ambient pictures and you can go in there and you can look. Okay. Um, but if, but if you live in DC or if you live in any metropolitan. Oh, let, okay. I like this. I like this. So the direction where this is going, um, the living in DC, if I'm looking for an authentic anything restaurant, things tend to be a bit more, um, sectioned out here so if i want korean food i'm not going to go into dc i'm going to go to annandale um easily like the most populated korean place in the dc area now while we were talking i did a search on yelp for zeshwan zeshwan matt zeshwan 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 uh zeshwan yeah that uh restaurants in the area and like it's giving me and, and this this annoys me it's giving me Chinese and Korean places that sell Szechuan food. And I think this is a big indicator. Like you're not going to get authentic Szechuan food from a Chinese place. Um, vice, and the same thing's true. Like you're not going to get authentic Chinese food from a Szechuan place. So if you're looking for Szechuan food, look for a place that actually specializes in it and says they specialize in it. If you're going to a place that says, hey, we sell Asian food and we have Chinese, Japanese, and we do teppanyaki as well as we do Korean barbecue, run. Don't pizza. walk. Run. <laughs> Don't forget the pizza. <laughs> oh, yeah, the pizza. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. If we find – so, all right, the way we find an authentic Chinese restaurant – and the reason why we're focusing on Chinese right now is because Chinese food has been huge in the United States. You know, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese have been just recent phenomenals that have come over here and people have a, a really got into their food as more of a niche type thing, I think. Uh, we'll argue about that later. But to find a Chinese restaurant, an authentic one, is, okay, I, I don't know what Sichuan is, what Hunan is, what... what northern chinese dumplings or lanju hand-thrown noodles are and how do i go about finding this right if i was if i was um if i was living in let's say uh andy if i was living in college park in atlanta and you know my my food background is more in McDonald's, 
Ryan's Golden Corral, that kind of thing. Um, if I wanted to explore and experience culture through food via the Chinese people, and Matt, you can answer this too. I don't know if we really answered that first threshold yet, right? No, and, and, and I think I have a better answer for you. I think maybe. Let me know what you think. I, I think I'd start with a dish. Find an authentic Chinese dish. Like, I think you would find if you typed in dim sum and you find a restaurant that says, hey, we specialize in dim sum, good chances are they're pretty authentic. Because there's, it's kind of a niche kind of thing. It's growing in popularity. You're going to see a lot more of it. But um, if you find a place that says, hey, we're a dim sum restaurant, you, you probably have a good chance of getting authentic food there and trying dishes there are, 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 are your best bet. Uh, but start with the dish. Start for, Don't start with sesame chicken. Um, start with, uh, oh God, I don't know. Uh, Peking nut. You can. I, I just feel like a lot of people say Peking duck now, and well, they don't actually know what Peking duck is. You still really can't find duck. Duck isn't really a common protein that you find inside fast food Chinese, right? right. And Cantonese Chinese. Um, so I, I think Peking duck is a good starting point. Peking duck and roasted pork. Now, I think hey, you're onto something. I, I think you're onto something, Andy, is that I think where we were 15, 20 years ago, where the internet wasn't readily available to us, where it is today, you can go onto YouTube and look for different authentic Chinese without having to type in Hunan, Sichuan, or Lanju, or anything else. And I'm saying anything else because I don't know anything else that they have <laughs> out there. And, and find a recipe. And if you don't live in a metropolitan area, you can go on Amazon and buy the ingredients that are needed for those recipes. And you find somebody who's on YouTube that has a Chinese accent, there's more than likely <laughs> a very good chance that they're going to give you the authentic recipe for you to follow step by step and make the authentic food, have the authentic flavors and see what it tastes like so that you know what to look for when you're going out to search. So we live in metro areas. We can go out and we can find that. But if you're living in a smaller area like where we were originally from, sorry, Andy? Uh, I was saying itch. Like there are certain ingredients that you can find in Asian countries that you just can't get here. Like green onions. Yeah. Like we have an idea of green onions that is far from what you'll get in, uh, in any Asian country. The green onions we think of are like, you know, maybe a quarter inch thick when they're large. No, Asian green onions are freaking huge. And they're delicious. They're more pungent. They're they're amazing, and they make a huge difference to the dish. Um, and you're just not going to get that here. So when it gets like absolutely authentic, you're just not going to get it because those ingredients okay. aren't here. Yeah, yeah, that I'll agree with you when it comes to fresh ingredients. So yeah. one of the plates that we talked about earlier was the Sichuan uh, pepper chicken, right? Where it uses dried roasted red peppers, Sichuan peppercorns. Uh, and other recipes that uh, other ingredients that you can get here in the United States, there are ingredients and there are recipes that are being made in the United States that uh, you can find on YouTube that can introduce you into different styles of Chinese food so that when you are finally ready to search for that in your local area, you can find it. Now, if you're in a smaller area like Savannah, you might not find an authentic Chinese food restaurant, right? But a metropolitan area is only anywhere between two to four hours away. There's Atlanta, four hours away, and then there's Jacksonville, two hours away, right? So if you're living in a smaller city in the United States, I think that if you really wanted to dive into a different culture's food and experience how they eat, how they dine, and really taste what their palates are accustomed to, that it's worth a four to six hour trip to go to those metropolitan areas to experience that authentic type food. And, you know, you make a really good point, Andy. We were talking about, uh, we were talking about earlier in this podcast was that, you know, back in the late 1800s and 1900s, we, the food that we experience today that we know as Chinese food in the United States came to be because they couldn't get ingredients from china but there are still ingredients that are cooked in ethnic asian groups cookbooks that 
you know, we, we can't get the ingredients to here in the United States, right? We, we still experience that. But at the same time, we still get to really experience great food that we didn't 20 years ago. And I think that 20 years ago was when we start to see a lot of these different groups come in and bring in their more authentic recipes to restaurants. And then over the last 10 years, we start to see these different groups start to sprawl out into the smaller cities where they start in the larger metropolitan areas like New York and LA. We're starting to see them coming into areas like Savannah, uh, Macon and the other, other small areas in the United States. Uh, but you know, so we're going to, we'll go ahead and wrap up Chinese food real quick. There are a lot of really good Chinese foods, right? I don't, and Matt, if you're if you want to share, please interrupt me, because uh, you know Singapore, like um, Taiwan and Hong Kong, are just sub mainland China, right? So uh, oh. 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 you're gonna make a lot of people pissed off. <laughs> yeah, I <know>. yes. <laughs> Yeah, I get that from my wife a lot too. <laughs> I tell my students, "Oh yeah, my family are Chinese people." She's like, "What? <laughs> We're not Chinese." <laughs> What's your input? What was your experience with authentic Chinese food uh, from the areas that you've traveled to versus what you found in the United States um, to be similar and different? Um. Well, my well, my first original experience with. Chinese food is, I think, is similar to most Americans, which is the fast food restaurants and um, or all you can eat Chinese buffets. Um, but when eventually my wife came, she's from of Chinese descent. Um, we were trying to find food that made her feel like home. So like we did, like kind of like Andy was saying, was that we look for specific dishes that we were trying to find. And we took a while for us to find actually. Um, but when we did find it, when we found the, a specific Sichuan restaurant that specializes in Sichuan food and the people were from Sichuan and that the food experience there was amazing. Um, but it also happened when we did find it, there was actually other authentic Chinese restaurants that happened to be close by as well. So we got to other, experience other authentic types of food. So. I think that usually if you find these kind of places, it could be kind of hard to find at first, but I feel like it opens a door to other experiences. So, so how close were these authentic Sichuan food in the United States compared to what your wife found at home? I thought actually it was very close. And when my friends and family from Singapore actually came to visit us, they actually thought the Sichuan food at that restaurant was actually better than the ones that they can find here in Singapore. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <That's> impressive. <laughs> yeah, so I actually missed that that particular restaurant. <laughs> but so, it was very amazing. I, I tell you what's really interesting is when I travel, I travel to experience the food of the locals that I travel to. I don't, I don't know how true this is, but many of the Americans that I know who travel across the states or abroad never go to other countries to look for authentic American food because one, we don't even know what that <laughs> is, right? But I do notice that people who are coming from other countries to the United States for vacation, they'll come here and look for their authentic foods, which is quite strange. But that's, that's interesting to know that the food here in the United States is better than the one that's found where you guys are living. So I think it was I'm going to oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, I, no, I just fine. want to interject real quick. Uh, I, I disagree that people don't look for authentic American food outside the United States. And I, and the reason why I say that is because if you look up street food, pick an Asian country, pick any country, if you look up street food, you, you'll see American esque kind of uh, things. And, and what I'm pointing to is hamburgers specifically. Um, hamburgers, hot dogs, those kinds of things. Korea has this huge, huge following of street food vendors who are trying to create the American hamburger, which honestly, after watching t a ton of those YouTube videos, they're not even close. No, but okay. That's, that's bullshit. <laughs> that's, that's, you know why that's bullshit? Have you been to a Korean corn dog stand? They go Those way overboard on fucking corn dogs, man. They're no, like, I <laughs> they're like okay, look. but I bet it's delicious they're, because they're, Koreans they're, love yeah, corn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, is that okay? American corn dog, fucking hot dog, 
surrounded by cornbread. <laughs> Korean corn dog. <laughs> I can't fit the shit in my mouth. Because, like, <laughs> it's so like, much fucking shit. I would try it. Yeah. No, it, they're, they're, I love Korean corn dogs, but you can buy a Korean corn dog without fucking hot dogs. But that's American influence, right? There's no way you're going to tell me like, oh no, I mean, that that dates is, back to is, the Korean War when the North came down. But but that's like, not authentic, right? No, no, no. But I I would say it's authentic American. No, uh, I say I, no. You said it was American influence. It's not. Oh American. no, I, I'm saying I'm saying I think it's people outside of our nation looking for for authentic American food, which oh. I think which I thought was your point. Well, well, yeah, I mean... When we leave, we don't look for American food, but, I mean, why would you? Uh, I don't know. I disagree with you there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... When, when we go for vacation out, we don't... <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so, so why is it worth it to find authentic ethnic foods? You, you know, so you're, you grew up in the United States. You're so used to fast food Chinese. Why, why go out and find something that isn't what you're used to. So if I go into, you guys remember uh, Chef Lou? That sounds familiar. Uh, no. dumplings, dumplings. I took yes. you guys to the yeah. dumplings. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So I took you guys to Chef Lou in Atlanta and they're, they're gone now. Um, after that? they after they lost their soul, okay? Uh, before then, they were in this little shack where they only made dumplings and buns and noodles and you couldn't find rice. I remember going into Chef Liu uh, the first time and just being absolutely floored that I couldn't find rice. But where they were from, that wasn't something that was a staple. Where the rest of us in everywhere else in Asia find rice as a staple. And when they moved to that area that I took you guys to, you could order rice because they made rice available. They didn't just make rice available. They had space for it. People were demanding it. But you know, think about it. If you ordered a Chinese uh, pork, steamed pork bun made with a lot of flour, do you really want to eat that with rice? The answer is no, right? You, you can really enjoy Chinese food in different ways that you didn't before, like uh, lanju uh, Chinese noodles, where they're making the noodles in front of you. There are TV shows that are, I think, being a little bit hyperbolic when they say that it's becoming a lost art. I, I think people can figure out how to make noodles, right? Uh, and, you know, they make noodles right there yes. on site. Yeah, and, and, you know, they hand tear them or they cut them up and they make soup out of these noodles. And that's something that is not the same as, say, Sichuan food or Cantonese food that we've been talking about or we've been experiencing, right? So what's the value in somebody who say, okay, well, you know, my life is really great eating General So chicken, or going to Asian buffet, South Pacifica. Why, why, why am I going to go out and search for Hunan, Sichuan, Lanju, or any anything else that's available out there? What, Chinese wise, why? To be better. Sorry, uh, and Matt looks like he's thinking, so I'm going to step in. Um, food is first cultural. Uh, Next, like food is something that satisfies you. You can go to the nutrition aspects. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people to say, hey, no, food is just sustenance to get you to the next day. If you are, stop watching. This isn't for you. Um, Food is cultural. Uh, If you think we're heading to a world where those cultures are going to be separated, um, you're just wrong. And I, I think a shining example of that is if you go to all recipes, uh, you'll, you'll find tuna salad there. And I think it's like Barbara's tuna salad or something like that. Probably the best one on there. It has curry inside the tuna salad. And at first you're like, oh, wow, why would I do that? Make it, try it, and you'll realize it's the best tuna salad you've ever had in your life. I guarantee you it is the best tuna salad you've ever had in your life. Um, and it's just because of that curry it, it adds it adds a bit of umami in there that you wouldn't have expected um and, and it's it's incredible but but that that's why you try different flavors uh that there's no reason why spend your entire life eating hamburgers hot dog cereal when you can try an array of flavors and then mix and match like you have the world at your disposal do something with it so let's assume that not all of our listeners are hipsters what's umami 
Oh God. Um, all right. So I might butcher this. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's going to be chefs Matt, who stop watching after what, this. What's what's umami? Because uh, Andy's miswired from his Japanese whiskey here. <laughs> um, I'm going to butcher it as well. No, but I feel for you? my own, what my personal, I to me it's about a savoriness. Is how it's about kind of a meaty, salty flavor to a food. That's how at least I would personally describe what savor uh, umami is. So, so I think flavor is a bad way to describe umami um, because I don't think anybody says, oh, this tastes like umami. It's more, I'm trying to think of the Japanese word for it, but it's about mouthfeel. It, uh, the Japanese word for umami is umami. No, 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 no. <laughs> mouthfeel, mouthfeel, how they, um, I forget, I forget what it's called, that, but there, there's an actual term for mouthfeel. And I think well, my umami comes down to that. Uh, but umami is like... Um, the feeling in your mouth of fullness like when you swallow you're like oh that felt good that felt like what we would call soul food yes, um yes it, it's it's the feeling of it's the savoriness without the flavor like when we think of savory you don't think of um uh, a flavor in general right you think of hey this is savory this is making me feel good this lingers like i feel warm inside that's umami um, umami is just a broader aspect of savory. So when you think umami, think like the dumplings in your chicken, uh, chicken and dumplings. Think uh, the Worcestershire sauce inside of your meatloaf or inside of your hamburger. Think, think those kinds of things. The things that linger in your mouth that go, oh, this feels good. Um, that's umami. And, and I'm butchering it because there's a more technical definition, but I, I'm going based on feelings here. So, so it's interesting that you use the words soul food because when i think about soul food uh i describe soul food as salt um <laughs> soul food is actually my, salt and fried yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love soul food it's probably my favorite uh branch of cooking um but i i think to me umami umami whatever you want to call it and however you spell it how do you spell it uh it's, it's balanced. pretty easy it, 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 <laughs> oh yeah okay it's balanced, right is because uh, umami is really a balance between sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and is that it? So umami is the fifth, right? When you balance those together, you get umami. Is is that it's perfection and flavor of what you're mixing. Now it's weird because when you're talking about something like perfection and flavor or taste, it's usually subjective. But when you're talking about umami, it's something that should be subjective that transcends subjectivity and for the most part most people if not all people love and enjoy things that are umami and it soy sauce being one of those everybody loves soy sauce um low sodium soy sauce uh so but it, it is it i don't know how we got here but umami is important and it's a good nexus and transition into our next food, which I think the next few foods we'll touch uh, really quick bases on, uh, quick, whatever. <laughs> is next food is second most popular food in, in the United States, Japanese. So when we talk about Japanese food, what do you think about? Go ahead, Matt. Oh, my first, and my first thoughts when I think of Japanese food is either sushi or ramen. God dang. Yep. <laughs> don't even know from Japan. Andy? <laughs> well, let's, okay. So I'm just going to, just a little side thing. The ramen is from Jan, uh, Japan. Ramyun is from Korea. It's just, you know. Um, okay. So when I think of Japanese food, I'm thinking teppanyaki. Thank you. Like automatically. Sushi? Um, sushi? I mean, sushi's, <laughs> sushi's good. It's just like find good sushi in the United but States it, and I'm going to be about, impressed. Right? It's, 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 yeah, sushi and ramen are love you, Matt. But sushi are are like uh, after you've done levels one through ten in teppanyaki, level eleven <laughs> is where you can finally wield sushi, right? And then right. eventually you find out that ramen, the word ramen is Japanese, even though ramyun, what is it, ramyun? Uh, ramyun, ramyun is, yeah. is, is Korean. Mi is Vietnamese. I think mi is also Chinese, but um. It, it, uh, sorry, Andy, I, I sold that from you. So, tapenyaki. 
teppanyaki <laughs> um and then if i want something more like street food uh okonomiyaki i think it's what it's called and it's yeah. like this cabbage pancake with egg and a ton of veggies and they spring with like pimento on top it's oh it's heaven yeah nobody um, in the united states think about japanese street food man <laughs> no. well they should because it's teppanyaki. It's, <laughs> but teppanyaki um and i i think the traditional things that Americans think about is going to be your hibachi. Um, and hibachi is the name of the grill, if you didn't know. Um, it's not a name of a style of food. So uh, when you're talking about hibachi, that big flat metal thing that they're cooking on, on in front we of you sometimes. Huh? We call the griddle. griddle. Yeah, yeah. So the flat griddle, that is your hibachi grill. And when you're, you know, you go to a hibachi restaurant, they're just saying like everything's fried on there. Um, and I think a lot of the Asian foods that are accepted in the United States in general are typically fried, um, which just appeals more to Americans. Like, I encourage you, if you're going to try an Asian food and you're going to venture out of your comfort zone, pick a soup. Um, I think most soups are going to take you way out of your comfort zones. And, and I don't mean egg drop soup. Um, if you're going to do egg drop soup, get it from a place that's authentic because it's going to be a lot fishier than you expect. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's what I think about when I think of Japanese food. So, you know, it, it's, it's weird because Japanese food has always been described as teppanyaki or hibachi, which is practically the same thing. Right. But no, no, uh, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> teppanyaki. Teppanyaki is a very specific kind of, uh, grilling. Teppanyaki requires coals. It's small bites. They're usually on skewers. It's it's no, no, very specific. No. That's when you put yaki in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me take, take a step back. Tapon is, uh, in the United States at least, synonymous with hibachi. Correct. In the United uh, States, yes. Yaki and what you were referring to with the coal, yakitori, are Japanese skewers, right? Is they're they're pretty much Japanese kebabs, correct? Chicken liver, yeah. beef, beef, or whatever else. And these aren't things that most of us in the United States are familiar with. And I know you guys knew when we grew up in the area that we grew up, we had one hibachi place, and all they did were fucking onion volcanoes. Because when you you ask me about Japanese food in the United States, I'm thinking Japanese teriyaki in the mall, or I'm thinking fucking onion volcanoes with Flipping spatulas and knives. Which, Should be now. Yeah. Well, you know, one of my first jobs in the food and beverage industry was a teppanyaki chef. So I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. Never mind. Yeah. I lied. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I it, it was teriyaki everything, right? You got fried rice, teriyaki, vegetables, teriyaki, meat, whatever it is that you want, you can have it as long as it was teriyaki. You know, Matt had mentioned sushi. Sushi was. It's not something that I don't, if you went into rural America and you said, hey, man, have you tried this place's Maguro? <laughs> <Or Toro? laughs> They'd ask if you got a cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. What the fuck are you talking about, right? Um, but, you know, Japanese restaurants have, be, have evolved. Uh over the last two decades, we know that they they started out as this hibachi thing where you came in for entertainment and the cooks would entertain you while they were cooking your steak, your shrimp scallop, or what's the other one? Your chicken, right? God damn, man. Japan doesn't have enough space to grow cows or chickens. They're eating seafood most of the time. And when you're talking about sushi, it's practically all seafood. You know, there are restaurants that make seafood out of steak and chicken, but those are not the rule. They're the exception, and they're really novelty items. But when you're talking about things like sashimi, chirashi bowls, and nigiri, and, you know, onigiri, and uh, okonomi, uh, oka, say, say it again? Okonomiyaki. Yeah. Uh, takoyaki, and all these other things that were not available in the United States 20 years ago are starting to become a lot more available to the, the casual diner here in the United States. 
right? Uh, we're starting to see revolving sushi. We're starting to see quick sushi pickups inside malls. And we're, we're seeing, and hell, Publix and Kroger's and all of your grocery chains are starting to carry sushi on certain days or are carrying sushi every single day. And now you have access to that. And that's been a major change in Japanese food over the last 20 years is that we went from this very American palatized food to what we see today in sushi. Now, here's the thing is that if you were going out and you were getting dragon rolls and California rolls and spicy tuna rolls and kanikama nigiri, you're not really experiencing Japanese food for what it is, right? Because well, Andy, you know, we, we've sat down, we've, we've had onigiri inside a Japanese restaurant, which onigiri can be found inside a Japanese gas station in Japan, but it's something that you have to search for in the United States. Uh, okonomi, damn it. Okonomiyaki. Yes, I'm going to say it right one time, or even takoyaki, <laughs> right? These are things that you don't typically find in mainstream Japanese restaurants that are leaking into mainstream Japanese restaurants that are becoming more available. So when you're looking at Japanese restaurant, let, let me ask you guys the same question. How do you, how do you find something that is more akin to Japanese restaurant? What makes Japanese food special that is authentic Japanese compared to what we grew up with and what we know as mainstream Japanese food in the United States? Uh, you mind if I go first, man? I'll go ahead. Um, so I think a lot of, I think Japanese is incredibly intricate in terms of the culinary universe. Um, and I don't mean to throw shade at China uh, and the Szechuan region, but Japan in general, I think has more methodologies that you need to employ in order to do their things right. Sushi, for example, it's not something that people can learn by like going to college or going to a culinary school and pop out and be like, boom, I can make sushi. It's a lifetime of learning. Like you literally go underneath a master and you try your best to keep up with them. And until they say you're ready, you're not ready. Uh, the best sushi chefs in the world, you're paying three digits for like two pieces of sushi. Um, and, and that's important. Like it's methodology. It, it's almost madness to get authentic Japanese food. I am concerned to think that authentic Japanese food actually exists in the United States um, in its purest form. I think you'll find your typical like um, ripoffs, like American sushi, and I'm going to call it American sushi. Like if you call that Japanese sushi, I think most Japanese people would slap you. Um, I think that kind of stuff gets you close, but not far enough, especially since the wasabi here, nine times out of 10, you're not getting real wasabi. You're getting horseradish that's been food colored. Like real wasabi is delicious. Um, and you can eat it on its own and it's spicy. It's amazing. It's pungent. It's incredible. Uh, finding an authentic Japanese spot here is going to come down to, again, what kind of dish you're looking for. If you're looking for sushi, quit. If you're looking for a teppanyaki, there's probably some places uh, in, in Seattle or uh, California. I wouldn't say so much on the East Coast that you can get like authentic teppanyaki. Um, food trucks would probably be my first source to find authentic Japanese food. And that's my answer. Matt? Yeah, I to be honest, I don't think I've really ever had real authentic Japanese food in the States. Um, I think I've, I've had in Japanese inspired food, you know, Japanese, um, I'm sorry, ramen in the States that tastes maybe kind of like Japanese ramen, but it was always like a bit of mix of Japanese, uh, sorry, American flavors mixed in with it. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned ramen, Matt, because it's, you keep on mentioning ramen, but ramen is really one of the the core foods of Japanese restaurants that most Americans have not experienced. And ramen restaurants right now in the United States are exploding. You can find them almost everywhere in metropolitan areas. I don't know about smaller cities, but in much metropolitan areas, there's one in every single corner. And they all they all taste the same. Yeah, you, you know, they're when, slightly better than Maruchan. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, no. You're gonna... <laughs> um, uh, there, there's nothing that prevents any individual from going into a Japanese grocery store or an international farmer's market that they sell Japanese groceries or even a Super H, which is a, which is a Korean grocery store, to purchase authentic Japanese ramen that is not freeze-dried noodles and has a, a broth base that you can cook and taste very similar to an American-based ramen restaurant. I don't know if that tastes the same as authentic Japanese because I've never been to Japan, uh, but according to my Japanese friends and colleagues, it's pretty authentic, right? As far as ramen is concerned. I don't think that ramen, you know, ramen's a weird thing because here in the United States, we look at ramen as a poor college student food, right? And when my in-laws found out that I was feeding my family ramen, they kind of freaked out thinking that we were poor and not financially secure. <laughs> but, you know, we were using ribeye steaks to dress our ramen and with other things that we were adding to our ramen. Yeah. You know, so, so by the way, I, and I agree with you, man, I, I think that people should focus on ramen when they want to try something that is authentic in Japanese because Japanese ramen it's nothing close to what you get in Maruchan or, or, or Panda or whatever, whatever the else it is that you buy inside Walmart. Uh, but Japanese ramen is, is quite fantastic, especially when you're eating noodles that haven't been freeze dried uh, and you're using a broth that is either pork, which is tonkatsu, or miso, which is soybean based. And then you add things like pork belly, eggs, and different type of produce to your ramen to really make it into a, a full course meal. Ramen is a great example and a relatively inexpensive example of getting into authentic Japanese food without having to travel far. You're able to buy that stuff on Amazon or I was going to say fresh market, but it's Amazon too, isn't it? Uh, and really get the experience of Japan. Uh, now, uh, the Whole Foods is, is Amazon. Fresh market is a different store. It, oh, well, I, I don't shop. I'm sorry. It's Whole Foods, not Whole Fresh Foods. Market. My bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the sushi perspective uh, and the other types of food that you get in Japan from street food uh, as in Okonomi, 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 Okonomi. Oh, sorry, go ahead. And takoyaki, and um, <laughs> I, I'm saying that too because you know, I and yakitori and yakitori and all these other Japanese street foods. You know, there are restaurants in metropolitan areas and even smaller restaurants in uh, smaller cities that offer you these types of food, but you, you got to give it a try, right? Yeah. It, it's like uh, I, I was just in Amarillo, Texas a couple of weeks ago and I've never eaten fucking cow nuts before, and I figured, okay, well. Let's go ahead and give these cow nuts a try, better known as Rocky Mountain oysters. And I thought they were going to be quite rubbery. And they were. When they came out to our table, my entire family enjoyed them. They were some of the best fried foods, American fried foods that we ever had. Until you bring them home as leftovers and you put them in your fridge, and you try them the next day. <laughs> They taste like balls. But other than that, they didn't taste like balls the first day. <laughs> well, I guess they taste like balls from the kitchen, but they were balls. But, uh, you know, so, so with Japanese food, to, to your point, Andy, yeah, uh, I, I think that there is there's a problem with Japanese food in America is that sushi that we know it in the United States are usually maki or rolls, right? They can be fried. They can be these weird and odd things that are put together. But sushi is really about, um, it is kind of an umami perspective where you're mixing vinegared rice, fish, soy, uh, nori, which is seafood, uh, seaweed together and making it a really tasteful, event when you're eating and fishy a uh, fish should not taste fishy if you right. have fish that tastes fishy it's bad fish just... and, and that that applies to everything right not yes. just sushi but even american grilled fish if, you, if it's fishy it's not good uh but in in the context of sushi is, is that it's 
it's really tough because you when we're talking about Chinese food and authentic Chinese food, you can go into Chinatown in San Francisco and or Oakland and get authentic Chinese food for very little cost. If you want really good sushi, and I mean really, really good sushi, you're weeks out on reservation. You have very small seating capacity at the restaurant and you're paying a lot of money. It's not available to the lay person, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, Matt, dude, I love ramen. I love Japanese ramen. And to make good Japanese ramen with the pork belly and the eggs that the way they make it takes a lot of time, which is not something that, you know, I sit here and say, it's not something that a lot of Americans have time for, but then you look at Japanese work schedule in any way, in any <laughs> event, it's not something that's easily made, but when you're looking at sushi, it's so difficult to get your hands on great sushi that it almost makes it impractical. Don't you think? If I can, if I can jump in here on this, um, like I want to touch on ramen and sushi. So with ramen, what makes ramen good? And I don't think we've talked about this because you can get maruchan, you can go to your local ramen joint, um, you, you can try stuff, but what actually makes ramen good? And it's always going to be the broth. So ramen is a description of the noodle. Like we, we call ramen ramen because they use what's called ramen noodles. Um, but at the end of the day, a good ramen is good broth. So when you get a tonkatsu and it has the pork in there, it's got the, um, the half boiled egg, it's got the noodles in there. What makes it good is that broth. That broth is made. It's a good mix of umami. It's a good mix of salt. It's delicious. And this is what I was talking about before. Like we're talking about methodology here. Um, and one of the best examples I have of methodology is actually a Vietnamese dish. It's pho. Pho takes days. Um, it's incredible. Uh, I think it's probably the broth. I think that takes the longest amount of time that I'm aware of. But the process is so intricate that messing it up or speeding it up, speeding it up is just failure. You're not going to make a good pho that way. Um, did we lose you? 10? I'm here. Okay. Uh, okay. You're not going to make a good pho that way. And same thing with ramen, like speeding up that process, trying to get that broth uh, to just, you know, come from a packet. It's not going to be good. So looking for good ramen, uh, you're not trying to say, oh, these noodles are good. You're tasting the broth. It's a soup first. Um, the noodles are second. Uh, in Japan, th there might be more methods, but there's, there's also a way to eat, you order ramen and they, they give you a bowl of broth. You take the broth out and you have the noodles on the side and you dip the noodles into the broth. And then you eat the noodles because at the end of the day, the noodles are just a mechanism to get the broth into your mouth. So ramen itself isn't just about the noodles. It's just what it's called. Good broth makes good ramen. Good broth makes good udon. Well, let's, let's, let's not ignore the fact that, well, number one, you're right. Uh, and we'll fix the camera after break here. This is that uh, good broth, means everything in ramen. But I tell you what, if you have chewy pork or you have shitty ramen, it still won't work, right? It's got to be a balance. And the word umami comes from Japan. It's a Japanese word. And I think that anything that the Japanese do is a balance between all of the ingredients that they put in to make a very good final plate where you can really enjoy the savory, the sweet, the bitter, the sour. And I don't know if that's really the ingredient of mommy, by the way, but you know, that's, that, that's really where the Japanese thrive at is that their foods minus gyoza really bringing everything together <laughs> and making it an experience of all the flavors at once. Um, and I don't want to get into Japanese food too much longer because we're about, we ran over an hour and I'm starting to realize. I want to, I want to finish on the sushi real quick. Yeah. If you don't mind. Um, good sushi. Like, what makes it good is two things. It's the rice and the fish. Uh, don't, don't go for a place that if it's got a ton of rice on there, just stop. Like the whole sushi burrito fad that's happening in the United States, please end it. Uh, it's ridiculous. It makes us all look stupid. Um, just stop. Uh, good sushi comes down to the fish. If you can't taste the fish, if the fish doesn't, isn't the highlight of the sushi, 
you don't have good sushi. So when you're looking for authentic Japanese sushi, you should be able to be like, oh, this salmon is amazing. Like I can taste it. It's rich. It's filling up my mouth. It's fantastic. Sure, you can get the egg sushi stuff, um, tamagi. I forget what it's called. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, it's not it's not like fantastic. I don't know if it would qualify as sushi. Um, I think if you're starting out with sushi, you should be really looking at sashimi first. And sashimi is literally just bits of fish. And once you know what that fish should taste like, because I don't think many Americans would be able to tell me what a good tuna tastes like um, raw. Um, I, I think you start there and then go to move to sushi because you're losing a lot of the flavor of the fish as soon as you add the rice. And because what most people like is how much sugar they put in sushi rice. It is a lot. Yeah. Uh, and you're right because uh, that is important in sushi. It is the fish and the rice. And, you know, I would argue that the separation of the two would make a good understanding of what the fish tastes like on its own and what rice tastes like on its own. But food is not just based on what their cultural origination really is. It's an evolution of what food becomes, right? Sometimes we call it fusion. Sometimes we call it Americanized or whatever it is. But even monkey rolls that are really popular in the United States, some of it is really good. And by the way, let's go ahead and take a break because I got to pee and I got to fix my camera. <laughs> And then okay. uh, we'll go back. We'll wrap up Japanese. But here's the one thing that I realized, Andy. Uh, mm. We're never going to be able to make these things one hour. And if nope. you stay with us, <laughs> we talk cool. too much. But, but we can make this two parts. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, it's 446, 450. How about that? That works. See you in a bit. All right, see Matt, what's the red thing to your left on the bottom right hand of the screen? Right yeah. here. Yes. What is that? Yeah. Um, something that my daughter just got into <laughs> that I was not happy about. <laughs> it's a are bread, those, are like those a, with the cream filled inside? Uh, no cream. Oh. I don't believe so, at least. But it's kind of uh, it's a bit doughy, actually. Can you bite into it, or are you not filling up to it? You don't have uh, to. Not feeling it. I just. That's okay, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I just want to see inside. Oh, so it's just like straight bread. Is it sweet? Yeah, it's sweet. It tastes a bit a mix of some donuts and cornbread a bit, actually. Oh, oh man, I want to try that. Oh, you just piqued my interest. Oh, yeah, that sounds incredible. What's it called? And they don't have a name for it. Uh, um, so I, for, in Singapore culture, they actually have a lot of these kind of similar type of snacks and they're always in these type of containers okay yeah and they, um, they kind of look like fortune cookies from this far away and i was like what is that okay well might as well eat it yeah they have a, a lot of these kind of things so do you have a favorite dish yet oh for sure oh me and me and joyce were just talking about it what you got because we're oh i don't have a favorite of these I'm, no, not, no, I'm still no, not in Spain in general. No. Char goi chow. Goi chow? Char goi chow. Char goi chow. I'm saying it wrong, aren't I? Goi chow. Yeah. C H A R. Uh huh. And space. Uh -huh. K W. Yeah. And then it should pop up. Char goi oh, chow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would not expect an A in there. This is uh, cooked with uh, pork lard, a lot of pork lard. It has some uh, seafood and meat. Are you it. working out yet? Uh, I, 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 uh, I don't know if you <laughs> want to talk about this or not, but I'm seeing a little bit more chubbiness here that I don't remember yes. seeing before. <laughs> and yeah, here, I was. Yes, you're I getting, was. You're getting the Asian cheeks, the Asian high bones here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I should be working out. This is not I, I, I